AI is going to want to use Bitcoin for everything because with all the knowledge AI has, which really is just scrubbing and crawling the internet and all data and all information. So if that's in a sense, a perfect human of having all this information, what money would that system choose? It's going to look at everything. It's going to look at the history of scams and whatnot, and it's going to choose. If the internet just tomorrow said there's an internet token and it's and its price is going to reflect how valuable it is, how many people are going to use the internet, want the internet, that's Bitcoin. I am a maxi, but I also feel like, hey, if you have the extra money and you want to go play with Dogecoins, fine. Just don't confuse the public into thinking that's the same as Bitcoin because those are companies. Bitcoin is a protocol. It's like completely different. We've never had one. Everything has been an attempt, a surrogate. Everything has been the best thing that we could find. We found, you know, seashells, rocks, tobacco, hides, shells, whatever. And so now we finally have, we have proof of money. We, you know, aliens have landed. And wow, we have, there's proof that there's actual money. You said like uh, you're known as, as as Mr. Hollywood. Like why why is that? I, I also saw it in your, in your bio. Well, I mean, I'm not Mr. Hollywood, but you know, uh, bi the Bitcoin space is so small, right? With less than 0.1 percent adoption, um, we all are sort of looking for different voices in different areas. And like you, you know, have, being in IT and security and stuff. Like what's what's the fiat world that you're in as you're crossing over into this beautiful bright orange world that we've all found. Um, And so there aren't a lot of people from Hollywood. And so people will view me as that guy, even though I'm not Mr. Hollywood, but, you know, I've produced 20 feature films. I've made 30 TV shows. Um, you know, I've, I've done a lot in Hollywood. I have deep connections. I've lived in Los Angeles my whole life. And so I've, I've concentrated on story. I've concentrated on allegory and messaging, you know, and a lot of Bitcoiners will come into the space they'll start to figure out what Bitcoin is to them. They're not necessarily writers. They're not copywriters. They don't really know how to tell story. And so they're saying the right things, but they fumble through it. And so new people are like, oh, this doesn't make sense. It's complicated. You're talking about Merkle trees and nonces and like, wait, what? You know, and it's almost like trying to explain the internet to an alien right now. Like we don't need to go back to, to what the internet TCP IP really is because it's actually quite complicated. We could just say, Hey, it has democratized information. It's decentralized access for the whole world. Anyone can access it. Anyone can share. Anyone can get videos, photos, you know, all the things that we know about the, the similarities between the internet and Bitcoin. So. We're at such an early point in Bitcoin that I think people are looking for better ways to, to explain Bitcoin, to tell stories of Bitcoin. What is Bitcoin? What is it backed by? What's the intrinsic value? Like, why is it used by criminals? And we can explain better with story than just hitting certain facts that uh, I don't think resonate with people. So um, because of my background, Uh, certain companies will reach out to me whether they're starting. So I've been contacted by apps or like new wallet, new wallet companies, um, or some people that have been putting out long form articles, whether I physically edit it or they're just like, is there a better way to say this? And sometimes I'm just shaving syllables, right? Like, like a comedian, like you ever go to a comedy store, Robin, or a comedy club and you hear the joke and you go and you tell your friend, well, you're telling them the same joke, but it's like, wait a minute. It was a lot funnier at the club, it just didn't come out right. But it's literally the order of the words and where they put the punchline. So I, I just love geeking out over messaging. Amazing. And uh, this, the, the viewers no, don't know, before we recorded, uh, I talked about lightings to you and now I feel stupid because yeah, all of the, you, know, you know that stuff about lighting and I explained it to you. Oh no, it's all good. I mean, I don't have it here, but yeah, I just, uh, yeah, no, yeah, it looks great. Uh, do you have a do you have a, um, a favorite Bitcoin movie or a, a movie that is not about Bitcoin but uh, Bitcoiners love? Is is there like a favorite movie for you? Well, I mean, I like the ones that a lot of Bitcoiners do like, whether it's The Big Short or whether it's The Matrix or whether it's the TV series um, Mr. Robot, because I think all of those spoke to. Um, the world that we've been living in where we didn't realize we've been in this fiat world. And so we have always been trying to solve problems, whether it's health, education, finance, but we were never aware of the first principal problem up here with broken money. Like you just don't think, you just think, oh, I need to hustle. I need to make more money um, and I can solve all these problems. But we didn't realize we just were choosing the wrong form of money. Um, 
And so that's what I like about the matrix, which teaches you to unplug, open your eyes. Like there is a system and we can escape it or we have to hustle and play the broken games within the system. Um, and the big short too helped people see that uh, it's, it's not equal rules for all of the players. We're all coming in to play a game, but they can put points on the board at a different rate and, and in an easier way than we can. So I like movies like that. And that's actually one of my goals is to continue to intersect Hollywood and Bitcoin where we can tell stories about Bitcoin without it necessarily being directly about Bitcoin. Like there's enough people in our space making documentaries and short forms and they keep coming out all over and those things are great, but we need something that speak to the stock bros and all the real estate guys and, you know, everyone chasing GameStop and AMC. Um, they need something that speaks to them. That's kind of what I liked about Dumb Money. I don't know if you saw Dumb Money, which was the GameStop movie, but in a weird way, it was a lot of it was very similar to Bitcoin. They were literally even stealing our memes. Like they used HODL, you know, and things like that. So um, it's not an easy task because Hollywood doesn't directly want to talk about Bitcoin right now, especially after all the centralized finance scams of FTX and Celsius and, you know, some celebrities like Tom Brady and other sports people got caught up in that. So, um, and they still conflate the two, they conflate crypto and Bitcoin. So um, it's going to be a slow process, but we'll get there. Do you, like you said, you're also nerding out about messaging. It, do, do you think the overall messaging of, of Bitcoiners and, and, and Bitcoin sometimes is a little bit too toxic and it should be a little bit uh, more, more smooth and more loving? Sometimes it is. Yeah, sometimes I feel like, you know, some Bitcoiners can get too judgmental and can get very toxic. I get where it's coming from, right? Like we have finally found the perfect money, right? We've engineered a perfect money finally for the first time in history. And that's why I named my book Proof of Money. My thesis is that we've never had money. Everything has been an attempt, a surrogate. Everything has been the best thing that we could find. We found, you know, seashells, rocks, tobacco, hides, shells, whatever. And so now we finally have it. We have proof of money. We, you know, aliens have landed and wow, we, there's proof that there's actual money. And so I get why people get toxic because they don't want people to get distracted. Like that's not money. But, you know, I also don't yell at people that go to Vegas and people that want to play poker. It's like as, as long as they know that they're gambling and as long as they know, do not put your generational wealth in this. Do not put your IRAs and your retirement in this. Then, you know, I think people can do what they want. Um, I mean, I am a maxi, but I also feel like, hey, if you have the extra money and you want to go play with Dogecoins, fine. Just don't confuse the public into thinking that's the same as Bitcoin because those are companies. Bitcoin is a protocol. It's like completely different. So I, did, um, I think that's what a lot of um, altcoins or shitcoins, as I also like to call them, <laughs> are doing. They, they are like uh, they're presenting themselves as this new a decentralized protocol that improves on that and that thing uh, onto Bitcoin. Like they always like going like, oh, Bitcoin is great, but here's why my altcoin is even better. And this is that uh, thing they improve on. But what you're not saying is like, in order to improve that one small thing, they have to screw up a whole not a really big thing that's really good that is in Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, it's like, Sometimes they they're having a really good messaging. Like I feel like the the crypto community over the Bitcoin community sometimes has like really good marketing uh, and really good yes. wordings uh, of it. Uh, and I feel like we we could even like steal something from them. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, the, and again, it's just understanding the difference between a company and a protocol because you know they're not wrong. Like maybe XRP can move the XRP token on XRP's blockchain way faster than Bitcoin can at the base layer. But that's not moving money just because that token moves around faster and can transact faster, if that's even true. I haven't looked into it. Well, but that, but that, but that's not moving around money. You're moving around a token that they can make as many of, that they could stop, that they could reverse, and that, yes, might have good messaging because they're well-funded because they've printed their own tokens and they're a company. Like Bitcoin, it's not a company. It's like we're all talking about the internet or the circle or gravity or the laws of chess. And it's like, well, you know, everyone's going to explain that a little bit differently. What did, what did inspire you to, to write the, the book Proof of Money that you mentioned first? 
What inspired me in a nutshell is that um, I got into Hollywood very early, um, Im immediately, and I started making movies right away. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be at the right place at the right time that I made a lot of money really fast and really young. And without knowing about Bitcoin or you know economics or or it, paying attention to it, I just thought, how do I hang on to this money? Because I got burned out really fast. I didn't just want to keep doing that. So I turned to real estate. Real estate seemed like the best thing. And we've all been taught, oh, they're not making more of real estate. It's scarce. They're not making more land, blah, blah, blah. And so I, I jumped in to real estate. But I also couldn't afford to just buy homes even with the money I had. So I, was, I had to learn to fix them up. And so I learned a lot about real estate. I got a broker's license. I started a mortgage uh, company. I started a flipping company. I started an Airbnb company. Um, I had over 20 homes and I did really well. It secured my wealth on, from Hollywood Fiat. But then I started realizing, well, wait a minute. Now I'm like this full-time landlord and getting these calls in the middle of the night. And I don't want to deal with toilets and trash and tenants and taxes. And that's what real estate was to me. So it opened my eyes when I started to hear about Bitcoin. And just like all of us, I thought it was a scam. Like, where is it? I can't touch it. This is bizarre. But once you learn about it and you realize, oh, it is, you can touch it. it it's just that it's the digital version. It's natively digital. And I said, okay, this is the thing. And we are in a digital world. I realized I don't have to waste my time and energy on real estate, which I am not as passionate about as I was, it was Hollywood. Like I just had to use real estate to preserve Hollywood. I would rather just go back to Hollywood, but now I can use Bitcoin to preserve my money and concentrate on what I want to, which can be Hollywood or can be anything else because it's preserving my purchasing power and my spending ability in the future. I can concentrate on my talents and my experience and all the sacrifices I made in the past. I can carry all those preferences forward in time because I'm not stuck, you know, at a house with my, you know, head under the basement trying to figure out the plumbing. So that's why I wrote the book. I said, wait a minute, we now have perfect money and all the things that we Bitcoiners know with all the characteristics and all the properties that make perfect money. And it's like, here it is. It's finally here. Even though we've gotten close with things like gold or the prior to that, the, the Yapstone from the Yapese Island, it's like, this is it. And I, and I just wanted my people to know. And the people that I were writing to were Hollywood people real estate people, stock people, people with major fiat minds, people that were doing well with fiat. So they don't get it. People, you know, I have friends that still do so well in fiat that they'll never understand Bitcoin because it, they don't need it. It doesn't help them. They don't think they it helps them. They don't realize they need it yet. Right. Like Michael Saylor says, uh, some of these people don't realize they need to be our friend yet. <laughs> yeah. He, he made also the 21 rules. Uh, and one of them was, uh, uh, something if they don't need to know, uh, like if if to, if you don't need to know about Bitcoin, you don't know about Bitcoin. I, I forgot the rule what it was exactly, but uh. the concept was like if if you if you're not uh, in the no, if you're not in the need to know about Bitcoin right now, uh, you don't have the Im uh, emergency to like oh let's really investigate about uh, Bitcoin right now. And he described it yeah. with like his 2020. Then he was kind of forced with his melting ice cube and all that. She like, oh, now he right. has to know that's about a good he actually like get about that. Uh, so that's that's really cool. And also like I I, I had a similar experience uh, what you described because I was in the stock world before Bitcoin. I was really uh, in the stocks. Even had like small German uh, YouTube channel about stocks uh, before oh, I had wow. that one, uh, which uh, most are not aware of. Uh, but uh, it was really interesting because I became the stock guy and all those uh, aunts and, and uncles and cousins were coming up to me like, oh, how do you do it? Uh, you, because I have done, done it actually quite well in stocks. Uh, and then they come up to me and uh, I tried to actually learn them how to pick stocks and how to get the, get a nice portfolio and, and what's how diversified you have to be and stuff like that. And I was like, uh, and I, I struggled ex extremely with that. Uh, because they didn't want to pick stocks. They didn't want to like uh, make a nice diversified portfolio with like 10 companies in there uh, with uh, different allocations. And what I learned then with Bitcoin after I learned about Bitcoin, I was like, they didn't want me to learn them how to pick stocks. They wanted me to learn them how to save their financial energy. And that's what Bitcoin is. You just like adopt the Bitcoin standard and then you can go ahead 
and concentrate on your fear job and on your normal job, just like, I don't know, as, as your doctor saving lives, whatever you're doing. Uh, that's and right. That's the beauty of it. Like you, you actually have all have money all of a sudden. That's right. Yeah. You shouldn't have to have a whole second job as an accountant or a broker or whatever, just to preserve your first job. hundred percent. And as a, as a, as a doctor uh, that earns well, if you, if we stay at that example, um, you have to have, like, if, if you don't have Bitcoin and you only have a few dollars, like you have to work a lot and you have a lot of responsibilities and you get paid good. Uh, um, and, and that's, uh, that's, right. that's okay like that, but your money just like dissolves itself. And then you have to work the whole time and you have to then depend on like a pension that you get from, from your government or maybe also not. Um, it's even yeah, there when you need it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, let's let's go back to, to the book a little bit. Um, what are your, the the core principles? I, I'm always fascinated with Bitcoin books uh, because they there are so many out there and they have so many unique perspectives on how to describe a Bitcoin and how to like get the point of Bitcoin across. Like there are a lot of different yeah. angles on that. Uh, what what are you focusing on? Uh, you also like so, said already a little bit with Hollywood and the real estate and and stuff like that. What are the core principles principles that you try to describe? Well, many of the core principles. I mean, telling someone like you will feel redundant. It's it's um, a lot of the principles that some of the other books have. It's just the way I do it. Um, for instance, um, when I explain what nodes are and what mining is like how how we even get bitcoin where does it come from and how do we even know it's scarce um i go through a three chapter arc where i take the characters from the tv show friends if you remember the tv show friends um i take them they're in a coffee shop they meet this guy named satoshi they don't like their bank fees so i i create this story where they join and they go through all of the steps of learning how to decentralize the money. Who's going to, you know, Phoebe is sending money to Ross. How do I know it was her? So what we learn about secret keys, private keys, the words, Joey's trying to memorize his words, but he wrote them down in the wrong place. And Ross is using his pet monkey to, you know, try to win the, the, the mining, the block rewards. And so it's as silly as it sounds. When I lay it out in three chapters, by the time you get to the end, you're like, Wow, I understand how miners interact with nodes, interact with users. I see how I can hold my Bitcoin, but how everyone has a copy of the ledger and how they all have to agree. Um, and the reason I did that partly, you know, oftentimes when you write, you write just to synthesize your own thoughts. It's, it's a very, it's a selfish um, practice. It's for yourself. And so I wanted to write that to prove to myself where my weaknesses were in understanding that. Because that was the part of Bitcoin that I um, didn't understand as much. The other chapters, you know, the, the, briefly, there's, you know, history of money, how we got to where we are. There's the fiat system, right? There's 1971. And then there's chapters where I compare it to gold, chapters where I compare it to the internet. And then other chapters where I just go through through allegories and stories um, explaining what inflation is, but without the economics um uh, without the economics and finance aspect, because uh, inflation gets lost on a lot of people, right? So, so here's an example, Robin. Um, I'll explain inflation first at a basic level in the book where I say, so look, the, our economy is 10 slices of pizza. That represents all our goods and services. You, Robin, you want to have a swimming pool built at your house. And I'm a swimming pool builder. So I say to you, okay, Robin, that's going to that's going to cost uh, one slice of pizza, right? Maybe you own two slices of pizza in this 10 slice uh, economy, right? So you're very wealthy. You, <laughs> you own two of 10, you own 20% of the whole network. Well, I say, hey, I need one slice to build your pool. Okay, so we have an agreement. I want one slice. I want the amount of calories, the amount of cheese, pepperoni on that one slice of the 10 slice thing that I know will pay for my workers, my time, will feed my family after I'm done building your pool. The economy comes in, the government comes in and re-slices the pizza. So they are not adding any new calories, no new quantity, no new goods, no new services. When they inflate, they inflate the money. But inflating the money is just changing the number. So this 10 slice pizza, it's the same pizza, the 10 slice, they've now re-sliced it. Now there's 20. So now I come to you, Robin, and I say, hey, remember you said you were going to give me one slice 
and I'm going to build the pool. Well, it just got cut in half. I now need two slices. Now, see, as a swimming pool owner, I don't want to charge more. I just need the same amount of goods. I need the same value that we had agreed on originally. I, I know how many calories that is to feed my family and my workers to, to build the pool. So it's just a different way of explaining inflation, but what it really is, because everyone thinks, oh, well, more money sounds good. You're just throwing more money in. They're just changing the number. They're just upping the number. There, there's, there's no new money because there's no new goods and services to correlate to it, right? It's the same amount. Um, and I'll do other things where like to explain Bitcoin scarcity. So, you know, some Bitcoiners will hate me for saying this because I know this isn't 100% accurate, but, you know, I, I used to get this all the time. How do I know there's only 21 million Bitcoin? How do I know more Bitcoin won't get made? It's like, well, yes, you can say, look, it's in the code. And as a network, we're all going to enforce the code. It, we are, we're all incentivized, you, Robin, and, and, and me. We're all incentivized to keep it to 21 million. We, uh, we, we get the value in scarcity. But I'll say, so this is, and so this is a little different, maybe. Um, but think of, think of it this way to explain. So Satoshi already released all 21 million Bitcoin on day one. All the, it, he put it all there. It's one big brick wall. There's 21 million bricks and they're all cemented on this big wall, like a piece of art that, that we can see. But there's this big curtain over it. Like, you know, you know how people lift up a curtain? Hey, look at my art. You know, he started lifting it up very fast, but every halving, every four years, it slowed down in half, right? And we're seeing, so like right now we can see 97 million of these 21 million bricks. But they're cemented. We can't move it. We can't take it. No one else can can add anymore. And once it gets to the top, that's it. It's over with. So when we have a Bitcoin, when we have our key, our key is telling us where on that brick wall it's there. You know, when people talk about there being, you know, four million plus Bitcoins that are lost, it's like, well, it's not lost. It's still there. It's always going to be there. We can see it right on the time chain or in this in this um, story, we can see it on the brick wall. But if someone's lost their key, they can't, they can't access it and give their key. They don't know where it is on this massive 21 million brick wall. Um, so I'll use little, um, things like that just to explain. And then I'll, and then in my book, I do accurately say how we know, but I think some of that helps just the same thing with the allegory of the internet. You know, people try to use gold and call it digital gold or, um, other things like that. To me, there's no better metaphor. Hands down, the best metaphor for Bitcoin is the internet, just period, because the internet is a network and we all benefit. Like, where is the internet? I can't touch it. What, what's the intrinsic value? Well, I don't know. The value is that we get to exchange information. I can see things on it. I, I can access. I can talk to someone else other side of the country. Well, Bitcoin is the same thing. It's valuable because it's a network. It's a base level network because it has democratized and decentralized value. Right. And that's the one element that the Internet left out. And so when people talk about, um, well, all these other crypto and all these other coins can do all these other things. Well, when the Internet started in, in the 1960s, it was just a military and academic email server. It really hasn't changed. The, it, the Internet is the same slow, dumb kind of um, base foundation. But we built everything on top. Right. WWW, HTTP, you know, um, is the internet a theater? Yeah, to some, the internet's a theater. Like the internet can be so many things. And I think the Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is, is pretty much the same thing. And it's because if Bitcoin wasn't an asset with a market value, I think people would understand Bitcoin more. Because when we talk about Bitcoin, we always talk about the network. That's what's so valuable. It's the network. It's the database. It's the decentralization, permissionlessness of operating and using this ledger of truth. It's because there's an asset. People are confused. What's, what is it? And that's why they think it needs to be a company. And literally, if the internet just tomorrow said there's an internet token and it's, and its price is going to reflect how valuable it is, how many people are going to use the internet, want the internet. I mean, look at how valuable it is, right? We're using it right now to record. Everyone's using it. And if there was a token that represented that value, that's Bitcoin. So I, I like that as an analogy to help explain it when people first start off with what is Bitcoin. It's like, stop talking about the asset and the price. It's, it's the network. Um, that's the extremely, how valuable it is. Uh, yeah. 
That, that's extremely powerful. Uh, I like, I, f I first love the friends analogy because I was a big friends fan. Uh, and I know even bigger fans are my girlfriend and my mom. Uh, so I might have like to check that uh, part of the book out and, and give it to them. So they, they, they might understand Bitcoin finally. <laughs> uh, and I loved, I never heard that, uh, analogy with the pizza. Like that was com something completely new with, uh, where they just changed the numbers. I heard a lot of different ways of how to describe inflation, but I think the pizza one is a, a powerful one because then you get like, oh, all of a sudden uh, you promise to like pay one slice, but that one slice uh, is just half a slice basically. And that's like a, a really powerful uh, analogy what you make here. Yeah. Yeah. It's like going back to whether it was the, you know, the coin clipping or whether it was debasing the metals. And it's like, you know, no one's clipping our fiat. No one's clipping the dollars, but yeah, that and since they don't want to change the number on us, because that's obvious inflation, well, they'll just put more in there, but it's the same thing. Definitely, definitely. Um, um, also like the, the TCPIP, I always like uh, to, to uh, compare it to the TCPIP protocol, or like kind of the, the internet uh, protocol where I'm like, imagine you could invest uh, in like 1992 in the in the in the whole internet protocol where later on facebook google microsoft all those great companies are built on top of that and you Amazing. can benefit from everything that is built on top of that and that's basically bitcoin like bitcoin that's is just it. starting out it's a protocol there are so many great things built on top of that uh, no matter if it's like an etf or lightning or whatever it's built on top of bitcoin uh, everything trickles down in the base asset and you can own it even if you're like in a third world country uh, and you're somewhere with an internet connection a phone uh, like there are even like solutions where you don't even have to have an internet connection but uh, it's a different topic uh, and you can just like have the base layer and benefit the same way as everyone benefits from 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 bitcoin and that's a really powerful thing that a lot of, a lot of people um that's right uh, get yeah, and, and Satoshi figured out early on, you know, that that to solve this because uh, so many of the failures that we have today in any system are because of humans. He 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 knew he had to remove humans, but he realized he had to use humans in a way to incentivize them. So he took the failures of the humans, which is greed, and used greed to add Bitcoin the token on Bitcoin the network because with greed we all want Bitcoin the token to go up. So we're going to continue to buy it, which will support the miners, which will support this energy wall of security, which helps support the nodes, which helps the money go up. So it's this continuous feedback loop of human greed, you know, because Bitcoiners are disingenuous if they say, oh, they don't care about the price. They only care about the network. Yeah, but if you if the price goes down, that, that network will be less secure. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21 Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistic. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video price is important as a, as a marketing tool do you have an analogy for how valuable bitcoin will be uh, in like 50 100 years because i think like when you explain uh to new people outside of the bitcoin world uh, bitcoin uh they often like ask the question like oh how high can it go go and the the, yeah. the the thing that they want to know is like oh what like what's the the market uh, a total addressable market of that like how high i can such a thing as bitcoin go and as the price the unit price and i, I hate that there's like a unit bias yeah. because like one bitcoin is like really expensive but it's not about the unit it's about the whole thing um, that's right and so so like do you have an analogy or a, a thinking model of like 
um, where Bitcoin of the value is going if Bitcoin is what we think it is? Sure. Well, a couple of them. So if I'm talking to real estate people, because they always d don't understand this, like, well, how can it, this be so expensive? And I said, well, look at the you know little old lady in Pasadena or look at someone's grandma who's like, oh, I bought this house back in the day for $3,000 or $2,000. Well, how is that house a million dollars today? So pretend that's Bitcoin. Today, Bitcoin, there's only 21 million houses. This is a new zip code. And right now, today, the houses are selling for you know, $64,000, $65,000. Will that $64,000 house someday be worth a million dollars when some of the people that buy these houses are going to lose their keys? This house will never deteriorate. It'll never fall apart. You'll never need to maintain it or whatever. And by the way, everyone is going to want to live here. So without going through all of those reasons why, because we know that alone clicks for real estate people because, you know, they are making more uh, land. They are making more real estate all over the world. Like there's actually plenty of it, it. It's true. You finitely can't, but it's also like saying a grain of sand is finite. Well, yeah, but there's tons of it, right? We're not going to run out of it. So this is, this is one zip code. It's the Bitcoin zip code. 21 million houses, and right now they're selling for $64,000. Or you can also look at stocks. So because stocks split so many times, look how many times Apple has split, Amazon, Tesla. We, They think, oh, well, the price is only, you know, and they have, like you were just talking about, unit bias, right? And they think, oh, this is only 80 bucks, it's only 100 bucks. Well, look at um, Warren Buffett's stock. He's never split his A-series stock, right? What's his, what's that stock worth? Isn't You would know, it's probably two or $300,000 or something. I, I mean, it started yeah, at, it, yeah, it started at 10 cents. So I guess how it can get that high because it's not splitting. See, Bitcoin's not going to split. No one's going to have to split it and inflate on people or for people to think that it's cheaper. In many ways, I do wish that we, we, that all of the exchanges also sold Satoshis at the same time because with unit bias, here, in fact, here is behind me right there, 1,543 Satoshis for $1 at the moment. Like that sounds really good, doesn't it? So it's, yeah, it's definite unit bias. Um, and as long as we, as long as you are pricing Bitcoin in your fiat, wherever you live, if you think the government's going to continue to print and continue to inflate, well, then Bitcoin will go up because Bitcoin is simply reflecting that Bitcoin is the scarce part the, the fiat isn't. So it's just math and it, and it will 100% have to go up. Also, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. No, I just wanted to, to make an example of real estate because uh, I always hear that from real estate people like, oh, but like, I know that real estate will always be valuable because people will always need a place to live in. And there's like only so much place in the world. And I'm like, no, you can like, first of all, like you can make a house and then you can build on top of the house. Then did you already seen the the development for Dubai? What, what they've built in the last just like, few, few decades? They, they just like added land in, in the ocean uh, or like just use some uh, some variants of the uh, big Sahara or some big of, of where like there are a lot of uh, places like even in Austria I'm living in Austria uh, yeah. there is so much free space like you literally drive and then you don't see anyone for like 10-15 minutes and then you see the next house like Austria is a small country and That's still right. there's so much space so I feel like is is real estate really that uh, scarce? And it's then really not. Yeah. I mean, look at Miami, look at Boston. Like they've added so much land that didn't even exist there. And also as money continues to inflate and debase and devalue and, and get more broken, we're just going to compress people into less space, you know, and we're going to get uglier buildings. Now they're four unit buildings. Now they're eight unit buildings, smaller. I mean, look how many people are living at home with their parents, right? I mean, maybe that's kind of a cool thing. I don't know, but it's, you know, it, there's, there's, there's plenty of land and there's plenty of ways to build and houses, you know, if kind of like gold, if the value of high housing goes up, people will keep making more housing. They will find a way to make housing. It will not stop. Because it's not Absolutely. scarce. I mean, gold is not scarce. People talk about it being scarce. It, it's not scarce. Yeah, because we don't even know, like, uh, we might get technical advancements. We might civilize other uh, planets. And then there's there another real estate. Maybe there's gold coming from there. I don't know. Like, there's so many possibilities of, of, of that. But even if we concentrate on Earth. Uh, but yeah, sorry, I interrupted you before. What, what did you want to say? Oh, uh, 
No. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, as far as talking about the the future price, um, in addition to using those two metaphors, you know, you just have to talk about the misallocation of capital and how many people are invested currently in things that they don't want, they don't really want to be in because they're passively invested with their brokers or they're in bonds, which, you know, have been losing for the last 12 years, um, or they're in risky stocks and they're tired of taking those risks. Like how many people will start to just reallocate into Bitcoin? whether it's as a first step through the ETFs or just through a, a superior step by learning about Bitcoin in the first place. I mean, there's, it sounds funny because even though Bitcoin is there to benefit the people that really need it, the disenfranchised, the, the oppressed, the surveilled, the censored, wealthy people have a big problem too. They don't know where to put their Bitcoin, I mean, to put their money. And Bitcoin is proving, I mean, it's just math. You can look over 15 years, you can look at the Kager, you can see how it's doing, you, the security of it. Like there's nothing superior to Bitcoin. So they're eventually going to come to it one way or another. And I think that's also going to just drive the price up tremendously, just capturing gold, and real estate and bonds alone. Like if you want to stay in stocks, I get it. Some people want to stay in stocks. You're basically 0% with inflation. You basically are just riding in line with what inflation does. But if you want to hurdle that and do something better for yourself and for your children, um, you know, there's a faster horse in the race, as they say. I feel like even the Bitcoin becomes the new hurdle rate. Like as more Bitcoin grows and grows and grows and uh, it becomes the new hurdle rate where when you really in, want to invest in stocks, you have to do a, a really good job in finding like the really fast horses and really emerging markets to actually outpace Bitcoin. That's why I'm now not in, in stocks. I, I love picking stocks. I like, I loved, I'm in Austria and I have to stay up like till one, two, three a.m. in the morning oh my to see the, the conference calls, uh, that was, uh, that uh, American companies are doing. I love doing that, but I don't do it anymore because I don't see any opportunity as big as Bitcoin right now that might change in like 10, 20 years. And I might get a little bit more excited about other investments again. Uh, but if you really want to do that, uh, you you really have to be really good. There might be some that can do it, uh, but it's, it's, it's a hard game. It's tough because like people like you have to fight activity bias, right? Because you have this knowledge and you want to go out there and trade and do fancy things with stocks, but it's like, you don't have to with Bitcoin. It's, it's really just like, it's like, ah, you know, just stop. Um, and it's the same problem I have. Like I want to get, I'm, I still get sent all this stuff on real estate and all these things. And I'm like, oh, this looks good. Oh, this would be fun. But I'm like, well, is it really fun? You know, I don't know if it's going to be that much fun and I'll make way more doing nothing just sitting in Bitcoin. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Do you also see that the whole, um, that Bitcoin will suck up the whole financial energy of, of real estate? I always see it with myself. I was in plans actually to, to try out real estate before I discovered Bitcoin. And then I discovered Bitcoin and threw, threw out all my real estate plans because I was like, oh, what, what do I have to do? Like this, this work is to do this work. Then I have to, uh, taxes, I have to make a company. I, like ev everything that you have to do for actually making a real estate thing, it's like, like starting a business it's not investing it's not saving it's actually kind of starting a business uh, and uh, I would be in probably now in real estate investor if Bitcoin was not there so th when we spin that more like real estate investors will come to the realization Bitcoin might be better uh, potential real estate investors might be like oh I, I'm just got I just gotta buy this digital property uh, how do you see that is it's like real estate coming down and makes housing affordable so I see two things. On one hand, I don't think real estate will ever go away. And I think it's always going to be attractive. In fact, if you ask most Bitcoiners why they're saving, they want to buy a house. They want their citadel, right? They want, they want property. They actually want real estate. That actually is the end goal for many Bitcoiners. But I think it will remove a lot of the monetization we have to do with investment properties. For a lot of properties that people are buying that they don't plan to live in or want to live in, you know, and so just look at commercial real estate, right? Like one of the biggest parts of real estate is commercial real estate. And what that is, is there's these syndicates where like you, Robin, will put in $25,000. I'll put in 25000 and hundreds of others will put in 25000 And we'll go buy a 300 unit apartment building and we'll put in new floors, new windows. We'll paint it. We'll hang on to it for three years, increase the rents, sell it. Maybe we make about 15, 20% a year. That's very standard. And I've done... 
30, 40 of those, right? They're, they're called real estate syndicates. That's most, that's, that's a, a majority of what's going on out there. You don't have to do that. Um, not only is it making way less than you would in Bitcoin, it's, you have to do a lot of homework. You're watching a lot of webinars. You're paying, you have to trust. By the way, many of these have broken down. I've lost money on these. You know, people have run off with the money. They haven't done what they said they would do. They bought at the wrong time at the wrong place. Jurisdictional rules have changed. Someone's put in an airport right next door. Um, someone fell off a balcony and sues the building. Like there's just, there's a lot of risk. There's a lot of liability. And then of course, you know, Airbnbs have been a very popular trend. I was part of that. I had places in Joshua Tree, Palm Springs, Nashville, Austin. I had them all over and I thought it was a genius. But, you know, I'm on the phone 24 seven and dealing with complaints and I never really got to use them or enjoy them. I bought them all in places that I thought I would like. And I was, you know, when COVID hit, I sold them all and put them all into Bitcoin. I said, uh, and it's, you know, it's been so nice. It's just been, you know, stress-free ever since. It's funny how COVID uh, was uh, such a huge catalyst for people to stop and think and actually go in whole different directions. <laughs> it was everything. Even though I came in in 2017, 2020 really hammered at home. Really just like, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, amazing. There'll probably be I another one, right? They say there's a bird flu or something coming. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm always the last to know about those stuff. <laughs> I'm like I'm known also in the family. I I'm I'm so obsessed with Bitcoin and technology. Like I'm I'm really now obsessed with uh, podcasting and how to make this this whole thing uh, go to the next well, level. You're good at it, which is uh, great. Uh, thank you, thank you. And but that's the that's the that's the the side effects that I'm like really bad in anything that's going on. Like yesterday, Austria played in the European championship and I got to oh, know right. about it like a day before or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. Yeah, uh, it's tough. I always think, you know, you podcasters are really doing Satoshi's work because, you know, I, I used to run a podcast back in the day. I did a hundred episodes and it's, you know, it's a lot of work booking the guests, sometimes listening to people that have said the same thing over and over or people, you know, you're tired of listening to, and then you've got to edit, you've got a quality control, push it out there, market it. And it's like, it's a lot of energy. It's a lot of work. Um, but you just, but you keep doing it. And I think, you know, we have this sort of recency bias, you know, even when people go on Netflix, they, they want to, you know, what's the latest movies? What are the latest three or four? Even though, you know, you can dig in and find something good. There's something about something being new. So I might be saying the same thing you've heard. And I probably am Robin, probably 50 times. It's okay. You can say it, but maybe there's someone new that's just finding your channel or searching. And this is a new, you know, this is, you know, June, 2024 or whatever, um, and so people might watch this versus digging down into someone who is 10 times better than me two years ago, you know? Um, so it's, 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 some of these things feel disposable, but it's good that we continue to open up more doorways and pathways for people to find, you know, and see what we see. I even think that uh, a podcast is th the best way to have new content all the time because uh, I myself I, I start doing that like a solo episodes and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the thing that I actually enjoy the most are the conversations because there's like actually new content coming in. And even though, yes, there are a lot of things that are uh, repetitive when you interview every day, I'm doing every day a Bitcoin podcast, uh, you, you hear a lot of the, the same things, but you always hear it in a different way and from a different yes. person. And that's what I'm really bullish of. Like, different people need different people to explain them Bitcoin. Like when I explain Bitcoin, someone might get it. And then when someone else explains it, then all of a sudden someone else gets it. So that's why that's I right. probably are incapable of, of orange billing uh, some portion of, of the person. But then there's, uh, I don't know, a, a friend of mine who also got Bitcoin. Uh, he explains it and then all of a sudden, like, ah, okay, it makes sense for me now. So that's why I think we need all of the voices and as many as we get. And I'm famous for uh, bringing people on a podcast uh, that have never been on a podcast. Like I have 10, 15, 20% oh, wow. of my guests are completely new. Uh, I even got one podcast uh, done yesterday 
with a guy who just commented on my YouTube videos, such long comments. And I thought, <laughs> for, thought their, the comments are so good. And I just like invited him and we made this podcast episode. It was like over one and a half hours. I enjoyed wow. it so much. It will be a banger episode. I'm really looking forward to releasing it. Uh, and so like new voices are amazing. All of, yes, I also have Jeff Booth and Michael Saylor and Natalie Brunel on. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you have a lot of the OGs. It, yeah. It's, it's, it's great to have them on, but I heard them over and over again. Like Michael right. Saylor said some new stuff, actually. I never heard him saying that. Uh, but, but mostly I hear the stuff that I already heard from him because, yeah, he cannot have new content every podcast he's in. That's impossible. Yes. Yeah. I mean, but, we're all uh, saying the same thing. I was complaining to someone else who does a lot of podcasts. I'm like, sometimes I feel like I'm saying the same thing. And he said to me, keep saying the same thing. Different people will, will hear that same thing. So I'm like, okay. So it made me feel better. And I watched uh, Seinfeld, I feel like, already four times, the whole thing. Yes. I, I'm, I, I'm one of the guys who is going on Netflix, and when he watches, I watch the same, like, seven TV series all over. Like, I have, like, several that I watch, like, two or three times. So I, I, have, not that, I have not that recency uh, bias on Netflix. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, that's good. You can break that. Uh, but uh, I'm, I've seen one thing uh, on, on your profile that I really enjoyed, uh, and it was like the, your pin uh, uh, thread uh, where you made this experiment. What if uh, the dollar is like you, you basically put the properties of Bitcoin onto the dollar and made this mind uh, switch for like, what if the, there are only 21 million US dollars and everyone yeah. wants the US dollars? That's, that was uh, amazing. And I love that analogy. Um, the, the question that I, I have with that uh, uh, is, do you think it's possible still that we save the dollar? It's like if, if, if someone really uh, uh, comes in in the office and say like, ah, yes, I want to save the dollar and then like revert all those money printing. Is it, is, are we still in the process of like, we could save it or is it like, it's just a downward and, and nothing can stop it? Well, it's a good question. I mean, I'm not one of those people that thinks that the dollar as a currency will ever be replaced. I think we will always have the dollar. You know, it could go digital. It could go CBDC. That's not a good thing. But I think we're always going to have the government is always going to want to have something they can control. Right. And throughout history, that has always been the case. They will they will never give that up. Um, and at least here in the United States, you know, we know that it it debases less than it does elsewhere. So it still looks really good, right? People in Argentina, Lebanon, Turkey, you know, parts of Africa, the global South, they, they, they absolutely want the dollar. And some people will tell you that, you know, that, that they'll, they'll take the dollar over Bitcoin. Um, but, but are we now entering a phase where it's going to continue to, to debase even more and even more and even Absolutely. Yeah, we are we are nearing the end, but I don't know if that end is still 50 years away, Robin. That's the thing. So to me, that still feels like a long ways away. And, you know, if, if it, maybe just uh, quickly for those who don't uh, wear with your pinned uh, thread, I, I loved it a lot how you just, just described it and and how you, you made that like perception switch of like oh imagine the US dollars and, and so like, can you can you run down this, this oh yeah this example a little bit yeah in general it's just a sort of mind frame shift for people that don't understand how important bitcoin scarcity is so everyone knows the dollar imagine that there are only 21 million dollars in the system period there will never be more made that's it if someone loses a dollar or it gets burnt up crumpled there's even less but there will only be 21 million US dollars ever. So imagine how valuable a house might be someday, an education, a business. What will $1 buy in the future if this, if this money supply isn't inflating? And when you think about it in those terms, as obvious and as elementary as it is, it really makes you think like, well, wait a minute. I really want, I want to work for these US dollars. Well, wait a minute. I want to hang on to them. I want to secure them. I don't want to keep them in a bank. I want self custody them. I don't want anyone else to take them because it's like, you know, having 21 million rare baseball cards, right? As people lose them, as they deteriorate, if there's less and less, it'll get that much more scarce and that much more important. So, um, I just used that analogy because it made me think one day, well, if everyone just likes the dollar and understands the dollar, would they like it and understand it more if it was ultimately scarce and getting more scarce? 
Because in that example, there's really, I think, I forget who said it, but they were, uh, I think it's 17 or even less, like 16.8 million Bitcoin are all that are really accessible. So we're really not up at even at 21 million when you count Satoshi's wallet and all the lost coins from the OGs. Um, so talking to someone who doesn't understand Bitcoin at all, just about dollars being scarce and never being more, it makes you reframe what you think of the dollar how and how valuable a dollar is that you're not going to just give it up for cheap goods. You're going to try to create rather than consume. You're going to want to save rather than spend. You might want to build rather than gamble. Um, so yeah, that's what that, I, I probably said it better in the pen, but. Uh, I, uh, and the, the thing that also came up in my mind was now like when, when we have like this number of like, maybe there are 60 million that are actually movable and, and, and still there. I think it's underrated uh, the amount of OGs that are like saying, I will die with my Bitcoins. I will not, like I will mm. make a sacrifice for the community and make Bitcoin even more scarce. I will not uh, put it out there. Uh, and they have like thousands of Bitcoins because they bought at like, I don't know, 20 euros or maybe even under a euro or something like that. Um, I think those who will never move the, the coins will be probably probably are underrated it's impossible to know about it uh but there are some ogs they are like just like really happy with their life and, and they're yeah. just like uh like i mean what sailor might be one of those right he yeah, i think, I think he talked he, about that right yeah he talked about how you are making a selfless donation to the entire network by simply dying with your bitcoin you know and i think it's a beautiful thing to think about because, you know, over at the Bitcoin advisor, you know, I help a lot of high net worth individuals figure out what to do when they die and how to get their coins to their heirs and their children. But some of them don't have children. Some of them do have a lot of Bitcoin and they're like, well, what do I do with this? Who, who do I give it to? You know, which charity should I give it to? And the other day I was telling this one client, it just popped out in my head, but based on what Sailor has said, I said, if you can't think of a good charity to give it to, just die with it because that'll be the best charity because you're giving it to everybody who really needs it. Everyone who's holding Bitcoin currently, it becomes that much more scarce and that much more valuable. And he was like, oh my God, I, that's, that's what I'm going to do. So think yeah, about that, beautiful. right? It's, yeah, it's pretty incredible. I have closer to my end and, uh, and oh, yes. uh, a very, uh, What's the difference? Uh, what's the uh, opposite of selfless? A very selfish uh, question. Um, I think a lot about podcasting and how we can make the best out of a conversation. Because if you have a conversation, you want to have like a really good conversation. Uh, and then ask that question because you said before that you're nerding out about messaging. What I started to do is like put a trailer in front of the podcast uh to give like some snippets like 30 seconds 40 seconds 50 seconds sometimes even like one minute and 20 if there's like really a lot in the podcast yeah. but it's rare uh that gives the view a little bit of uh of like what's in there and i approached it as a, a cinema tra trailer they are showing scenes of it but not like narrow narrowing a lot they're just like showing scenes and they kind of make sense and that's what I try to do, make a, a small story in front of that. Obviously, I'm really bad in this because I'm just starting no, out. No, but I like it. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I like and it. I, and I, I try to do that. Uh, and other than that, I have not a lot. Like, I just like have the questions and, and, and the conversation. I keep it really raw. Is there anything that you would say, like, um, uh, from a messaging perspective, from a, a podcast perspective, because a lot of podcasting do that with the trailer and, and then have just a raw conversation? Uh, is there anything that you were like, you would incorporate that, uh, I don't know, like a, a, a TV shows after a lot, like uh, they have a, a, a trailer or like something from the back uh, uh, episodes at the open. And then like, there's like this, this, this theme song, there's like 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Like, do you have any recommendation for me to improve the, the podcast and the, the, the messaging? Wow. Um, so first of all, I think you're doing a great job. Like I, I listen to a lot of podcasts and there's some extremely big ones. I won't name them like that are popular where, you know, they talk for 30 minutes about nonsense before it even starts. Like that kind of bums me out because I just want to get to the good Bitcoin stuff. Um, I think 
what has been working with television works with podcasts. And that's that you have a cold open. You don't explain, just boom, get into great sound bites. And you can, you can even cut them up. Great sound bite, just jump cut. Great sound bite, jump cut, great sound bite. And then, you know, I'm Robin Sear. Here's my podcast. You know, today we're with blah, blah, blah. And you just go in, just like get into the meat as quickly as possible. If you have to, like, I know we like learning people's origin stories, but I would maybe stick, I would personally cut those up and put the origin story towards the end. Like we didn't have to, we didn't do that with me, but like on some podcasts, they for 20 minutes have asked about me and I'm like, I think they want to hear about Bitcoin, but, but, you know, put that at the end. Cause once they've heard about Bitcoin, they might be like, oh, I like this guy. How did he learn about Bitcoin? I don't know. I don't know if that helps cause you're doing a really good job. I've seen what you're doing. Um, and I like it. I mean, it looks very professional. I, I've, uh, I found the starting only with the first ever pod, like with the first two episodes I did, uh, made an introduction for the guest that I, um, recorded after the podcast episode. Uh, since then I'm just doing the trailers. Uh, but uh -oh. I never asked like, who are you? Uh, what are you doing? Like, I, I feel like, um, they can look, people really can look boring. that up. Yeah. Like, even or, or even you can have I'm, a show note. Yeah, they have a show note, uh, and I always like have a, a link to the the main contact of of, of the of the uh, the person. So I'm like, they, they can look where this is. They have like a link tree or something like that. They can can see it more. That's right. Um, but but I I'm I'm never interested in 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 having like this like oh ten minutes we're talking about like what do you do and stuff like that. Uh, maybe a little bit uh, if it's interesting, uh, and sometimes I do that, but. Only if it's if it's interesting for me. Yeah, thank you for for your answer. I'm always like yeah. trying to 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 get the best out of a podcast. <laughs> I just don't need to hear about you know football for 30 minutes in London. Just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, perfect. Um, okay, perfect. Then uh, we come to the end routine of the podcast. Uh, it has two questions. The first question is always the same one, and the second question uh, comes from the previous guest. Uh, the first question uh, is, and I asked that because I think Bitcoiners are really unique people and we can learn from each other. The question is, what are we currently passionate? What, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Or what are you currently learning about besides Bitcoin? Oh, outside of Bitcoin? Uh, I'm learning about AI because I think... And not because I just like AI as AI, but because I think AI is going to want to use Bitcoin for everything. Because with all the knowledge AI has, which really is just scrubbing and crawling the internet and all data and all information. So if that's in a sense, a perfect human of having all this information, what money would that system choose? It's going to look at everything. It's going to look at the history of scams and whatnot, and it's going to choose Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah, AI yeah, is a big one. I... I often think about like how much AI did I use a year ago and how much AI do I use now? It's like not, not even close. It's a, a whole different uh, level. It, the other day was a uh, ChatGPT falling out and I was actually like, oh shit, I cannot work. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I have my processes, I have my GPTs that I need actually for work. And then I was like, oh, I have to do it manually. I have to do the research now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it, it, it bumped me out. Perfect. Then let's come to the end routine uh, where the previous guest uh, is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest actually is. Uh, and the question mm. for you is what in your childhood led you to question the world around you? So ultimately led you to, to discover Bitcoin. Uh, so I'm sorry. Could you repeat that one more time? Uh, yes. I also did not understand it actually when he said it first. <laughs> um, It's okay. What, I, I just... What, what in your childhood uh, led you to question the world around you, which now ultimately led you to understand Bitcoin? Oh, uh, the hustle. At, at a very young, early age, I realized that we're all playing a game and that you have to hustle uh, to make more money. And, uh, and I didn't necessarily want to be a hustler. Um, And so that helped lead me to Bitcoin to realize that I don't, I don't have to hustle. And I, and I used to be that guy. I've written books about it. Like I, you know, passive income, making money while you sleep, you know, how to create courses, how to, like I was that guy. And you know, it, it's an embarrassing, I cringe at that person now. I cringe. 
because I, I didn't have to be that person, but I thought I had to. I, I was good at it, but yeah. Uh, I mean, that's the, the, the ultimate goal to progress so much in life that you cringe at your younger self. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Perfect. And yeah, f thank you, Terence, for, for being on today. Uh, before I let you go, where can people uh, find you and ask you questions? Uh, proof of money at on Twitter or X is probably the best place to find me in the Bitcoin land. Um, and I have a link tree there if they need to reach out to me for anything. Perfect. Then thank you uh, for being on and uh, for everyone watching. Thank you for watching and I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye. Thank you, Robin. <laughs>